we're having some media problems this morning, they tell me. <clears throat> They're working on it. Hopefully they'll get it fixed. It would be a shame if they don't get it fixed because I've got some rock and roll music for you. Wouldn't that be sad? I want to welcome all of those who are with us online. I have some friends from Arizona who are joining us today, and we have other people online from various parts of the country as well as locally. We're always glad to have you. Also welcome those of you who may be watching this later on during the week on YouTube. There are several people who make it a point to keep up with us on demand on YouTube, and we welcome, welcome you as well. <clears throat> I wanted to uh, start off this morning with, uh, as we are talking about putting on the mind of Christ as we seek the heart of Christ, and in our continuing thoughts on that, um, I'm going to start with a, a cliché, uh, a truism, uh, a given, uh, an irrefutable fact. And it's very simple. <clears throat> it uh, simply is everything changes and ends. Would you agree with that? Everything changes and ends. It's true of everything in, in, that exists in time and space. From the very small macro world, atoms, atoms live and die. Um, to the cosmos, to the, to the uh, outer reaches of our universe, where stars are constantly in a state of either being birthed or burning themselves out, including our star. Everything changes and ends. Even our bodies, we wake up to a new body every morning. And it's a fact. We know it's a fact. But do we accept it as a fact? That's a little different. Um, I would suggest that uh, we beat our heads bloody against a stone wall trying to deny this irrefutable certainty. How much easier our lives would be if we simply accepted this given and rested in God's unchanging hand. When we're young, we, we struggle to do what? Get old enough that we can drive. Get old enough that we can get married. Get old enough that we can live on our own without our parents. And then as soon as we reach that golden age, whatever that is, 21 or 29 or whatever, then all of a sudden we start struggling against getting old. We provide an awful lot of opportunities for employment for people so that we can rage against getting old, don't we? We spend billions of dollars on magic potions for our skin and for all parts of our body to trade to wage against getting old. And that's not bad. I do it. I'm first in line. We'll even use poison to get rid of smile lines. That's how desperate we are to keep change from happening. <clears throat> and the same is true in, in the social world and in the commercial world. Um, we rage against change, even though we know that change is inevitable. I've shared with you before that there was a time in my life when, when, when I worked for Sears, Roebuck, and Company. 
Sears Roebuck and Company ruled the country. We, we were the Amazon of our day. The, the catalog was a, a highlight of the, the annual event. And when you got rid of the, when the catalog expired, you still had a lot of really good uses for that catalog <laughs> if you lived on a farm. But, but where's Sears today? I would propose to you that as one who worked for them and, and, and who, of course, they, would, they were still growing strong when I left, so you can't blame me for their demise. But I would propose to you that when Walmart came along and the environment, or the commercial environment changed, and the management of Sears says, we've been successful for all these many years. We're going to be successful forever. And they maintained the same model that they'd already had. And life passed them by. Things change. They change in our social lives and our families. They change in um, our religious world. I mean, you know, the Catholic Church ruled for centuries and defied change, but everything changes and ends. <clears throat> so many of the, of the divisions that we've had even within our own fellowship have come about because of us trying to cling to the status quo and not being able to accept that things change. And uh, the Jewish people in Jesus' day could not accept him because they were fixated on the status quo. Everything had to stay the way it had always been. And Jesus stood on Mount of Olives and looked out over the city of Jerusalem and wept because they could not listen to his message because they had to, they had to preserve and protect and defend what had always been in their life. I think that life can be so much more pleasant and enjoyable if we are able to accept this given. And I think that Jesus modeled that in his life. I believe he held, he held to this life with a very loose hand. He, he experienced the the mountaintop experience that we had last week where he uh, talked about where he was baptized by John and where the Holy Spirit came and lit on him and the voice of heaven declared him to be God's special chosen one. And he held that with the same type of looseness that he will demonstrate in our lesson today as he goes into the wilderness and there for 40 days and 40 nights, sinks to the lowest ebb of his life and is tempted and tested and tried. But even that ends. <coughs> it's not forever. And if we can maintain that attitude when we get into times so that are uh, really, really great and know that, hey, we're not going to stay on the mountain forever. And when we get into those deep, deep valleys where it looks like there's no way out except suicide. Even this shall pass. Everything changes and ends. For everything that happens in life, there is a season a right time for everything under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to collect the harvest, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build up, a time to cry, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, a time to pile them up, a time for a warm embrace, a time for keeping your distance, a time to search, a time to give up as lost, a time to keep, a time to throw out, a 
time to tear apart, a time to bind together, a time to be quiet, a time to speak up, a time to love, a time to hate, a time to go to war, a time to make peace. I know everything God does endures for all time. Nothing can be added to it, nothing can be taken away from it. We humans can only stand in awe of all God has done. What has been and what is to be already is, and God holds accountable all the pursuits of humanity. Jesus kind of commented on this, I think, in, in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, don't worry about life. Don't worry about food. Don't worry about what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. He said, consider the birds, how God cares for them. Consider the lilies of the field. In all of these things, God provides and God makes sure that we do not go and want. And he kind of closes it out by saying, so don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. The old black philosopher Hambone said, more than sufficient for the today be the troubles therein. That's probably true too. And the beloved apostle John said in John 1 and 15, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God will live forever. So that lengthy discussion to kind of highlight that um, if we can rest in the unchanging hand of God, then we can better stand the buffeting that comes our way, and we can better handle the success that comes our way. See all of it in the eternal purpose of God. Does that make sense? Uh, is there anybody who would like to add to or challenge your thoughts that that, that, that has, has stirred up in you this morning? Anything came to mind? Well, we're still going to have our, our uh, rock music, but we'll just have to do it next week, I guess. <laughs> hey, they're working on it. I can still see the screens coming up and down, but they're not having much success yet. Okay, so we left off. Um, <clears throat> we left off uh, in the fourth chapter of Matthew last week, and we are in the period in the... Uh, the biography of Jesus' life where he is being led out into the wilderness uh, by the temper, tempter and the, by Satan. Or he's led by the spirit where he encounters the tempter. The tempter came to him and said, if you are, some translations say, since you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus responded to that how? He quoted scripture, didn't he? He quoted from Deuteronomy 8 and 3, uh, which says, He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. And he verbatim quoted that. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he, will, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, 
so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Um, The devil, surprise, surprise, can quote scripture. Who would have thought? Who knew? Here he's quoting from Psalm 91. If you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Exactly what he's telling Jesus. You think Jesus has ever heard that before? Well, he memorized it, didn't he? He knew it by heart. So he's very familiar with the passage that Satan is laying before him to tempt him. And how does Jesus answer him? He quotes scripture. Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. You should diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his, and his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. When we get our slides back up, I'll show you the point on the temple where we believe Satan took him to tempt him with this. I think that we have to kind of if you put yourself right here in Jesus' place, physically, imagine you're standing beside him. Where are you at this time? You're out in the middle of the wilderness, right? Nothing there but rocks and stones. So when Satan says, turn these stones into bread, well, there's stones right there. You can see them. Here, Satan is carrying him to a point, the high point in the temple and telling him to jump off because the angels are going to protect him and you're going to, you're going to, be, you're going to have this great feeling of, of, of uh, God's presence in your life. I think that we begin to see here, and we're certainly going to see it in the third temptation, that this is not a physical thing. The spirit of Satan did not take the body of Jesus and stand it on the top of the temple, I don't think. I think that that would have created quite a stir in Jerusalem if the people in Jerusalem had looked up and seen Jesus standing on, on, the, on the corner of the Temple Mount at the highest point on the, in the, uh, the Roman garrison area and just standing there by himself or with some uh, physical manifestation of Satan. I think what we're seeing here is a, a mental temptation. Not a dream, perhaps, but it's something that's going on in a mental state. Are you ever tempted mentally when you're not tempted physically? Do you ever endure temptations of the mind where the body is not physically involved. You, you, can, you can think about that and let me know if you disagree with that. But it seems to me that if we're going to really visualize this by putting ourselves in, in the very location where Jesus was, um, then we probably have to understand this as being something that happens in the mental state, not in the physical state. <clears throat> and again, the devil took him up on a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. So now he's taking him up on a very high mountain. Um, I'll, Lord willing, we'll, we'll just breeze back through this next week so that you can see the slides because 
I have pictures of the mountain where um, people have traditionally accredited this as having happened. Uh, it's there in the, uh, the wilderness area, slightly in northwest of Jericho. Uh, there's a, the mountain is named and there's a monastery there and it's a traditional place where Jesus was carried by the devil to look out over the nations of the world. I'm saying that this is not a physical thing, but a spiritual, a, an emotional, a mental test because wherever that mountain might have been, if the script is literal, that he showed him all the kingdoms of the world, there's no mountain that you can stand on where you can do that, is there, David? The world is, is round. You can't see China from anywhere in the United States or from Israel. So we're, we're, it's not literal, which doesn't lessen the importance and the impact of it. It just puts it into, uh, into context. But here he's being shown all of the kingdoms of the world. And he says, all you have to do to have all of these is bow down and worship me. Well, that, first of all, says that the kingdoms are under the power of Satan, doesn't it? If he has the power to offer that to Jesus. So Jesus responds to him again with scripture, this time from Exodus 3. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. It was kind of interesting that uh, at this point, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Where have you heard that otherwise in Scripture? Where did that occur again later on? Peter, Peter right? Get behind me, Peter. Peter was uh, saying, Lord, this is never going to happen to you. I'm going to make sure this never happens to you. And Jesus used the same phraseology with Peter that he used with Satan. Peter, don't, don't interfere with God's work here. This is going to happen, and you're just a temptation to me. Well, let's talk a little bit now about searching for the heart of Jesus. We have seen now the, 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 the biblical account of Jesus in the wilderness, 40 days and 40 nights. And we've seen how he's been tempted. We've seen how he has responded to those temptations. So from this experience, what can we, uh, what can we learn about the heart of Jesus? What can we conclude from, deduce from this wilderness experience? about the heart of Jesus. What are some things? Anybody? Of course, I have the advantage. I had opportunity to think about it in advance. <laughs> well, the only thing... So, Is the mic on? Okay. Test, yes. Okay. The only thing that comes to mind first uh, is a focus. His heart is set purely on the will of God, uh, not allowing the distractions which are there to interfere with his goal. His goal is to be obedient and directed towards God, and so he is going to ignore the outside deal. He, it's not going to get him away from it, but he's, he said, this is where I'm headed. That's his statement uh, every time. This is where I'm headed. Uh, you can challenge me with anything else, but my heart's set on this. Can we make application of that in our lives? Yeah. Absolutely. 
Well, in fact, uh, one of the people that uh, Lindsay met that now dead when she was in uh, Los Angeles was an old horn player who was uh, past 100 and he was still taking care of himself and walking around and I think he almost made it to 105 or whatever, but everything's by himself and the question came up, how do you do this? He said, well, there's a lot of evil around me. There's a lot of people negative. And he said, basically, I have just formed basically a shell around me, and I don't let that bad stuff come in. He said, I try to keep thinking everything positive and focusing on what I can control and what I can do. And uh, the bad stuff, I just don't let it in. Excellent. I think you were right uh, uh, about Satan. He waits until uh, he draws up an attack plan on you from all four sides, and he comes at you at once, and he beats you into the ground until your resistance is practically gone. <clears throat> and that is when the temptation comes. He knows uh, our weaknesses so that's when he'll hit you. Uh, I've often wondered <clears throat> when, when Jesus told Satan to be gone, Satan had no authority to resist that. He had to obey the word, and Christ is the word. Uh, and I, I may be showing my ignorance here, but... Can we take this as an example for us to do the very same thing? When he comes at us like that, we use and call upon the name of Jesus Christ as our king to do battle for us and chase him away. Of course, we all know that Satan doesn't stay away. But then again, our king is still behind our back. He, he can repeat the process over and over again. I absolutely think we can. That's an excellent point. Anybody else? I think you kind of pretty well covered it, the things I had and a few others. I put down, he accepted the wilderness with the same calm manner and with which he accepted the dove and the voice of God. Kind of in keeping with our thoughts about everything changes and ends. He was confronted by and overcame Satan at the lowest physical point of his life, which is kind of what David was talking about. He waits till we are least prepared to confront him, and then he takes advantage of that. And uh, he used his baptism in the wilderness as a launching point for his ministry. We're going to see him leaving the wilderness and, and pretty quickly beginning his, his, uh, his dedicated ministry. Uh, I think this is one reason why he, we're told to keep ourselves holy. So we are capable of throwing the word of God around to resist Satan, having him flee from us. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so we're switching over now in our chronological look at uh, the life of Jesus to uh, John chapter 1 and verse 19, and uh, we're going to be looking again uh, at John the Baptist, uh, at his role in this uh, story that's unfolding. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Give us an account for yourself. 
It's kind of interesting. They ask, uh, John records who are, 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 they ask him who are, uh, or I'm sorry, are you the prophet? That's all John says. Um, well, he's already asked him about Elijah, so he's not, that's not who he has in mind, right? So who is the prophet that John, John the Baptist is being asked about when these uh, uh, people come out and, and challenge him and say, are you the prophet? Who is he talking about? What prophet is he talking about? I don't know for sure that I know, but, but most people theorize that he was talking about Moses. Uh, there's a passage in uh, Deuteronomy 18 and 15 where there seems to be a, a messianic message from Moses concerning the coming Messiah. And so it's theorized that when John says, or when the crowd says, are you the prophet? They're referring at that time to Moses. Um, a word about priests and Levites. All priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. Um, in order to be a, a priest, you had to be of the tribe of Levi, one of Jacob's 12 sons, but you also had to be of what house? House of Aaron. You had to trace your lineage back to the family of Aaron. Aaron's descendants served as the priests. The Levites uh, were the ones who served in the temple. They served at the orders of the priests, if you will, and took care of the, uh, of the uh, physical aspects of maintaining uh, the temple and the sacrificial system. But that was the distinction between those two. The text continues, John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been questioning him said, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ or the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? If you're not the Messiah, you're not Elijah, you're not the prophet, why are you baptizing? John said, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. They didn't ask John, why are you baptizing at all? because rabbis baptized. That was what they did. I mean, they, uh, that was part of the, the, the um, spiritual cleansing, ceremonial cleansing process that had been practiced for many, uh, many, many decades. So the question was not, why are you baptizing, but why are you baptizing the way you are? Why are you um, changing the ritual to make it mean something different than it has in, in the past? John, of course, baptized not simply as a, a ceremonial cleansing before some religious activity. He baptized as a demonstration of a changed life and a preparation uh, for the coming of the Messiah. So that was what their question was. Then we're getting ready now to move into uh, the next phase of, of Jesus' ministry. And this is John 1 and 29. The morning after this conversation, John sees Jesus coming toward him. In eager astonishment, he shouts out, Look, this man is more than what he seems. He is the lamb sent from God, the sacrifice to erase the sins of the world. He is the one I have been saying will come after me who existed long before me and is much greater than me. No one recognized him, 
myself included. This is a translation from The Voice, incidentally, if that sounds a little strange to you. So he sees Jesus coming and calls him out as the Lamb of God. But I came baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. As I watched, the Spirit came down from a, down like a dove from heaven and rested on him. I didn't recognize him at first, but the one who sent me to baptize told me, the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit will be the person you see the Spirit come down and rest upon. I have seen this with my own eyes and can attest that this one is the Son of God. So John is uh, making known to his disciples that uh, the next thing is about to happen. The next phase is coming. The day after, John saw him again as he was visiting with two of his disciples. John saw Jesus while John was visiting with some of his disciples, two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John announced again, do you see this man? This man is a lamb of God, God's sacrifice to cleanse our sins. So here's some of John's disciples gathered around him. John is having a conversation with them, two in particular at this time. And Jesus comes by a second time, two days later, after the first conversation. And John again points him out and acknowledges him as being the Lamb of God. And then John 1 and 37, at that moment, the two disciples began to follow Jesus, who turned back to them saying, what is it that you want? We'd like to know where you're staying, teacher or rabbi. May we remain at your side today. Jesus said, come and see Follow me, and we will camp together. So we, here we have the, the first two um, people who uh, have decided to become followers, disciples of, uh, of Jesus. The first one is Andrew. The second one is not named. Um, most Bible scholars believe it was uh, John. Andrew's going to turn around. And first thing he's going to do is go find his brother. Remember his brother? A guy named Peter. <laughs> and uh, they're going to be uh, the first uh, followers of Jesus. Uh, coincidentally, it wasn't planned, but coincidentally... Uh, Rick talks at some length this morning about uh, what it means to be a disciple in Jesus' day. And um, he goes into a little bit of detail about that. Disciple, uh, in Greek, uh, methetis is a student, a follower. Uh, in Hebrew, the word is talmudim. Uh, means the same thing as somebody who... Um, leaves everything and dedicates themselves to attaching themselves to their rabbi. They, uh, they literally live with them, travel with them, uh, l listen to everything they have to say. Uh, sit at their feet is another way it's sometimes described. There, is a, there was a saying among the, the uh, Talmudim, the the disciples of Jesus' day, when they would greet one another and, and they would say, may you be covered with the dust of your rabbi. And it was a way of saying, may you be so close to your rabbi as you walk down the, the road that his sandals will kick up the dust and that dust will affix itself to your, to your robes. And this was a way that the Talmudim would, uh, would seek to be associated with their rabbi. Um, 
we also have the term that we're, we're throwing around here now, the term apostle. Uh, apostle um, shalia in Hebrew, uh, apostolos in Greek. We use a transliterated name in English from the Greek, the word apostle. Uh, missio, missio in Latin, which we get our word missionary from, transliteration. Uh, the apostle uh, is one who is, is sent out. Uh, he is a messenger. Uh, he is an ambassador. Uh, apostles were, uh, were not new in Jesus' day. Uh, there had been apostles all along. And uh, as I was researching this, I was surprised to find out that uh, uh, the Jewish people today, the Orthodox Jews today, um, have groups of uh, apostles, large groups of apostles. And they use the same wording that is used in the, uh, in the Hebrew in Jesus' day to describe them. So the 12 apostles were um, not something new to culture, but they were probably new in the way that they were attached to Jesus and to his assignment, that which he used to send them out. Well, our time is just about out, and we have not gotten our slides up yet, so uh, you're going to have to wait a week to, uh, to hear the rock music. But uh, we will uh, review a little bit of this without trying to be uh, too repetitive next week, just so that some of the slides that I've put together, I think, for me at least, the visualization is really important in trying to put these things into perspective and to get a better concept of uh, where we're talking about and what we're talking about. So we'll just review those very quickly, and then we'll continue on into the calling of the Talmudim, the calling of Jesus' disciples, and how that came about. So thank you for your patience with us this morning as we have uh, struggled through this uh, in an unaccustomed way, for me at least, and um, hopefully they'll uh, be able to work out their, their technical issues uh, before second service, or Rick can have the fun of doing the same thing. <laughs> and I'll enjoy that. So <laughs> thank you for your presence. Thank you for all of you who have joined us online, and have a wonderful God-blessed week.